through the hallways of academia and on the face of the moon the footprints of conquest haven't left us any room to say Greetings and welcome to the fourth edition of Women's Liberation Radio News. WLRN produces a monthly radio broadcast to break the sound barrier women are blocked by under the status quo rule of men. This blocking of women's discourse and ideas we see in all sectors of society, be they conservative, liberal, mainstream, progressive, or radical, the thread that runs through all of American politics is male dominance and entitlement. My name is Sekhmet Sheowl. I have a background in writing, marketing, and teaching. I live in the southwestern United States. Today's program focuses on what women are doing to mark this one-year anniversary of the last Michigan Women's Music Festival, the largest international women's cultural event to happen for 40 years every August. The last Mitch Fest was one year ago in the woods of Michigan. We will also explore why women-only cultural and political spaces are important to women's liberation and feature an excerpt from an interview with organizer Sarah Jones about Wolf Fest, a radical feminist women's gathering happening the weekend of September 17th in the Redwoods. Finally, we will air an excerpt from an interview Elizabeth McEwen did with Ruth Barrett, contributing author and editor of the book Female Erasure, slated to come out just in time for the fall equinox. And hi, my name is Shante Hosey. I sit on the board of directors of WOOF, Women's Liberation Front. This month's podcast focuses on the importance of women-only cultural, social, and political organizing spaces. We keep on walking, walking, walking in a haze. Hoping that one day we'll rise above the burning blaze of a society gone mad. And here are today's WLRN headlines. On Saturday, July 16th, a panel of well-known radical feminists hosted an event in London called Thinking Differently, Feminists Questioning Gender Politics. Speakers included Sheila Jeffries, Lierre Keith, Julie Bindle, Stephanie Davies Arai, Mary Lou Singleton, Jackie Mearns, Magdalene Burns, and Julia Long. The Indiana Court of Appeals overturned Pervy Patel's Class A felony feticide conviction, along with the conviction for felony neglect of a dependent. Patel was originally sentenced to 20 years in prison for her self-induced abortion, which took place in 2013. She will now be resentenced for the charge of felony D neglect of a dependent. On July 26, the Democratic National Committee made Hillary Clinton the party's official presidential nominee. She is the first woman in American history to secure a major party nomination for president. Michigan State University closed its women-only study lounge, which had opened originally in 1925. Mark J. Perry, a professor at University of Michigan and a men's rights activist, had filed a civil rights violation complaint against MSU for the women-only space, but an MSU spokesman claimed that the lounge closing has nothing to do with that complaint. Earlier this year, MSU disbanded the school's women's resource center. Meanwhile, in Canada, 
Canada, the University of Victoria finished converting its women's center to a co-ed space, which will be called Third Space. Daphne Shayed, a transgender male, has been a women's center coordinator during the conversion process and sent an email to center members earlier this year prohibiting literature critical of porn, prostitution, and gender from being distributed in the space. The center's collective also issued a statement apologizing for its, quote, deep history of radical feminism, unquote, which they described as, quote, exclusionary, racist, and trans-exclusive, unquote. An anonymous group of women studying at UVic opened a Twitter account under the handle UVic Women with a Y, to respond to the space's conversion. Jessica Valenti, author, blogger, and columnist, was forced to leave Twitter after she received rape and death threats aimed at her five-year-old daughter. Corinne Gaines, a young black mother, was shot dead by police in Randallstown, Maryland during a standoff that took place in her apartment. Her five-year-old son was also shot, but is in good condition. Gaines is the ninth African-American woman killed by police this year. And now for our featured news story on the importance of women-only sex-segregated spaces in the movement for women's liberation. It was in female-only spaces that women discovered and developed feminism, and politically organized the marches, protests, and petitions of the first and second wave movements. Second wave feminists created service-based female-only spaces. DV shelters and rape crisis centers provided female survivors with rehabilitation and public sanctuary from male violence for the first time in history. Women's health centers provided health care designed to meet women's unique medical needs in ways that the male-oriented health care system did not. Female-only cultural spaces offered women the opportunity to share their art, educate each other, and talk to other women about common experiences of misogyny. During the second wave in the 70s, lesbians began to publicly claim their lesbianism and meet with each other in women-only spaces and lesbian-only spaces. In many cases, it was the freedom and safety of these spaces that allowed lesbians to come out and discuss their feelings and experiences, challenging compulsory heterosexuality publicly and consciously. Second wave lesbian feminist philosopher Marilyn Fry recognized female-only space as symbolic of female power and the subversion of male power and domination at the heart of patriarchal society. She wrote, Female denial of male access to females substantially cuts off a flow of benefits, but it also has the form and full portent of the assumption of power. It is always the privilege of the master to enter the slave's hut. The slave who decides to exclude the master from her hut is declaring herself not a slave. This not only describes a symbolic political coup that women execute when they create female-only space, but hints at the more fundamental boundary underpinning that space, excluding males from our bodies. Laura Kaminsky observes the first and most basic woman-only space is her body. Historically, women's bodies have not belonged to themselves, but to whatever male owned them. A male who rapes a female is violating her physical boundaries, just as a male who forces himself into female-only space is violating female physical boundaries. In both cases, power is represented in who determines female accessibility. The male or the female herself. Radical African feminist Patricia McFadden wrote, I think that one cannot consider the issue of male intrusion into women's political spaces without also considering that this demand is always made with a conscious desire to undertake surveillance on what women are thinking, saying, and doing. Men also tend to take over discourses and to steer them in particular directions, often adopting a defensive attitude towards women's radical consciousness and consequently damping down women's sense of entitlement to their rights. The presence of men in any women's space has fundamental consequences for women's sense of themselves and their visions of the future. In other words, women become conscious, formulate strategies for political action, and develop strength in their feminist convictions within female-only space as they never do in mixed spaces. There has never been successful political action on behalf of women's liberation without women gathering outside the surveillance and physical control of men. Without female-only spaces, there can be no feminist movement. I 
our commonality. Yeah. Mothers and daughters, women born, women, and we gather in the light of the August moon. Amazon women, and we're out in the woods, and we heal by the light of the August moon. Deaf women, hearing women, dancing in the light of the August moon. Girls and women in the Michigan woods, and we love by the light of the August moon. First time I came to festival, learned I'd always been afraid. To finally lay that burden down, I could not believe the way. Of all the trauma I carried deep inside my bones, expectations. Limitations I had made my own. Maybe we can't. We can't do nothing about the way they're framing us. We just keep keeping on, 'cause we know we are love. Yeah, we know we are love. 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 Mothers and daughters, women born, women, and we gather in the light of the August moon. Amazon women, and we're out in the woods, and we heal by the light of the August moon. That was Nija Johnson with our song August Moon, and now we will hear a report from Thistle Pedersen, filed from Michigan, from a variety of locations at Mitchfest Remembrance events. Women in the hundreds, possibly the thousands, are seeking refuge from patriarchy in the woods of Michigan this first week of August when the Michigan Women's Music Festival would have taken place. To kick Mishfest week off, L2L, a lesbian organization in Lansing, hosted the family reunion on a private 10-acre piece of land. There was a main stage with Mishfest performers. Oh, with Mishfest entertainers such as Mimi Gonzalez and Karen Williams. When I'm doing male drag, which I occasionally do, my character's name is Juan A. Nother. <laughs> Because once you've met Juan, you're going to Juan another. <laughs> I just and of course, one another uh, is yes. a femme. No, get out of here! No, he's not. <laughs> he is a butch. He's a drag. He's a drag king. But this was my point, honey. You okay. came out here saying you're transitioning yes. from a butch to a femme. Yes. But you do butch drag. That what means, part of that fits in the femme category? It was at the family reunion that I got to speak with Shen Womack Smith a longtime Mish Festi and vendor at the family reunion. I asked her if she thought women would go directly onto the festival land this week and why the land is significant. Do you think women will actually go onto the land? I mean, it is right across the street from the National Forest land that Amazon's Rising is going to be at, right? I absolutely think women will go to the land. I don't think it's possible to keep us off the land. I know as a property owner, I understand the liability and the no one can give permission it can't be given so we're gonna have to you know quote unquote sneak on um, but our sisters are there um, I have friends who are ashes are scattered there who will always be there so it's kind of an important important land and an important place because that's the only place I can see some of them and you know and go and visit and be there it's like it's, um, it's uh, in a way like a cemetery and home in a nest and it's everything and I didn't think it was that important until I started to realize how many women are still there. Awesome, beautiful. Thank you so much, Shen Womack Smith. Thank you of Bearded Dragons. Once out of Lansing and down the trail, I arrived at the primitive Amazon's Rising Camp and talked with Jennifer Corbett, one of the organizers, about the inspiration for Amazon's Rising and what kinds of things are happening. There are four different areas women are camping near the land this week. Amazon's Rising is in the National Forest with no internet access, no cell phone reception, no toilets or showers, and no coffee to buy in the morning when you get up. After Mish Festive last year, within a couple months of it ending, I am friends with uh, Gloria Downey. 
she's a veteran also and I met her through the veterans group that would meet at Mesh Fest and we would mark you know we were trying to think of what's next you know we were given the acorn what were we going to do and we would sit back and look at what was going on on Facebook and the different groups and what they were planning to do and we felt that was impossible to do in a year uh, to, to recreate something that took 40 years to develop so in talking and um, you know Gloria came up with this plan and and talking some more what more appealed to me and Gloria was um, something in which was really organic um, something that we could do in a year which was a more of a primitive camping environment where we could empower women to meet their own needs um, and let's watch some films there make it a film festival and uh, we know we wanted to do it close to the land so right across the road from the land is a national forest and it was the perfect spot last night at the camp there was a feast and a film showing using a generator these women brought to the woods the snacks were provided by women taking leftovers from the day before in Lansing Michigan from the live house concert Chris Matthews did, a Mishfest performer. Here is an excerpt from her song about this historic women's festival. It ain't no till it's over Not even when this August comes and goes And I'm wearing all of my shoulder For years I said and done And truly we were the last as long as I've got the memories Keep each of you with me From the sisters up in Baltimore To way down south in Ecuador And across the oceans Across the sea all of Michigan, in several different geographical areas, is alive with Amazon women gathering in their tents, in the woods, at house concerts, and on the land. This is Thistle Pedersen reporting for WLRN in Michigan. And now we will hear excerpts from an interview Sekmat did with Sarah Jones about the upcoming Women Only Woof Festival happening September 16th through 18th in the Redwoods. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the role you have in organizing Wolf Fest. Sure. So my name is Sarah Jones. I've been involved with radical feminist organizing just about the past year and a half. Uh, like you said, I'm on the currently serving on the board of directors for Women's Liberation Fund, aka Wolf, and I'm a core organizer for Wolf Fest, the first annual Wolf Fest taking place in September in Northern California. I'm responsible for a large part of the big picture organizing and decision making. Uh, right now, about just under two months out, I'm uh, involved with making sure registration is running smoothly. I manage our website, social media accounts, making sure we're on track with finances and fundraising. Pretty much have my hands in every pot, and so my role right now is to make sure that we kind of pull this off. It sounds like Wolf Fest is partially a response to the end of Mitch Fest but also something that organizers were thinking about simply because of the experience you had in your own camp at Mitchfest. Yeah, I think for me personally, you know, I volunteered to, my involvement with Wolf was fairly limited until I volunteered to do the food, be responsible for, for the kitchen at Radford Rapid at, at our camp. You know, and I worked with some of the other Wolf women there, met a ton of women. Yeah, I mean, uh, Michigan, I think that seeing how 
important that space was. And I mean, obviously the space of Michigan, we're not comparing it to that. I mean, that's just like a magical, a magical world. But just our space of the little camp was so important. And, and some women really did kind of seek refuge in exclusively radical feminist space. You know, these women, maybe they knew from the internet or something. And you know, I think uh, women who otherwise probably wouldn't have uh, made so many connections, maybe wouldn't have been very vocal in sort of a general setting. And I think if you're going to find more radical leaning women, it would be at, at Mishfest. But it was just cool to have such a concentrated group of us in our little camp. So I think if we could make it fun with just uh, our limited supplies and limited planning we had for that event, even though it took a lot of work, but um, we can make something amazing at Mishfest. Why do you think that women-only cultural and political spaces are important? Women are so fragmented in their consciousness. It, it's impossible for women to kind of recognize their status in a coherent class of women. And women's space is really the only way you can do that. The unique thing about women's oppression, basically, are women are the only ones who have to love their oppressor. So our, our oppression is unique because we're so intertwined with men, with our oppressors. Uh, we're just intimately involved with them always. And so it's really kind of revolutionary act to organize among ourselves. You know, it's, it's considered a threat. And women just don't have any space just for them. And the space that we do have or um, is being created or is being appropriated by men. I've just seen such amazing things come out of women-only space, even um, whether the a weekend gathering with women or a big festival. Just incredible things come out of just intentionally purposeful women-only space. So real quickly, if you could just tell us when Wolf Fest is. September 16th through 19th. So we start Friday afternoon and then we'll be rolling in and then end loosely Monday morning, wrap it up in September 16th through 19th, 2016, Crescent City, California. It's going to be three days of, what do you call it, radical feminist workshop, discussion, strategy, and revolution in the Redwood. And finally, here's an excerpt of an interview Elizabeth McEwen did with Ruth Barrett, editor of Female Erasure. What you need to know about gender politics is war on women, the female sex, and human rights. Ruth Barrett is a Dianic priestess who understands the importance of women-only spaces to women's spiritual practice. The full-length interview can be found under our interviews tab on the WLRN website. Can you give us an example of what some of the topics covered are, uh, different pieces in the book, what they discuss? Sure, absolutely. I have, well, I have six sections actually for the book. And I'm in the process of actually doing chapters. I have, at this point, I have about 45 or 46 chapters. And the, and the sections, like one of the sections is called Biological Erasure by Gender Ideology. And in that section, I really wanted to have pieces that were talking about that, that topic, biological erasure, and how that is showing up. Currently. And so I have a number of writers. I mean, do you want, shall I name some of them? Oh, sure. Go, go for it. Oh, okay. Well, I actually, I wanted to open with a piece written by Monica Shu and Barbara Moore. And these are two women who have passed. They passed in, uh, a few years back. And I actually am paying for the rights to republish this piece. But that was the opening chapter for a very powerful book called The Great Cosmic Mother. And that was from the late 1980s. But the topic was the first sex. In the beginning, we were all created female. And it's a very powerful piece to open, really open the project because it talks about physicality and sacred physicality as well. And um, how the body became basically other even from ourselves, a disconnect between mind and body. And there is a historical precedence for this. And I wanted to show that by starting with this chapter that what is happening currently, in, from my point of view, is that the erasure of, and silencing of women with this whole gender identity ideology is simply a continuation. Not This is nothing new how I understand it. It has actually been going on for thousands of years from when patriarchy in, began enacting itself in ancient culture and religion. And that's my background. So I'm and also a student of folklore and I'm also involved with women's spirituality and feminist spirituality to narrow it a little bit more. And so I wanted to start about, I wanted to talk about the issue in terms of a context of a and the context being a continuum 
of female erasure and silencing that can be traced from ancient times. And so when I look at it from this perspective, it makes perfect sense to me that it would be enacting itself in this way. But I did not expect it to enact itself the way it's come down. This this kind of was like a huge sideswipe. But I wanted to honor these foremothers and women's spirituality by starting the chapters with theirs, but also to set that context for in, from ancient times and then where we are going from here. So I take that leap then from that first chapter on the, in the from the first sex in the beginning we were all created female to a fantastic piece written by Rachel Ivey. It's called The End of Gender Revolution Not Reform. And it goes on from there with uh, Kathy Scarborough and Elizabeth Hungerford and Sheila Jeffries and wonderful, wonderful women who are in the educational system and or in the medical and mental health field. And that's all under this, this first uh, chapter on biological erasure by gender ideology. The last part of this section is actually an amazing piece written by Mary Calais and Jennifer Billick. And it's called, In the Absence of the Sacred, Marketing of Medical Transgenderism and the Survival of the Natural Child. It's an amazing piece. It's probably the longest piece in the book, talking about what, what this industry is doing to our, our children that don't fit neatly into a box and the whole marketing with terrible consequences to our children. And it's just kind of, you know, the people are going along with this, not allowed to question and only given one option, which is medical interventions for the, their children and so that's the first section <laughs> I'll, I'll go a little bit briefer into the other sections maybe this next section is called reframing reality and the language of erasure and this is i love this section so much because it really is about the the way that language has been used to literally reframe which is really a way of using language to manipulate how people understand a topic. This is showing up in this debate a lot. I mean, just even in the some of the simple things like, you know, trans women are real women. Just that kind of a frame. Oh, and of talking about a psychological identity being the same as physicality. And at this point in time, gender identity has supplanted not only phys physicality, our, our actual biology, but also the way that sex class oppression is, is enact, has been enacted for you know thousands of years. And it's all of a sudden, it doesn't really matter anymore. We can call ourselves anything we want, and it's undermining a lot of the protective laws that have been hard won around sex-based oppression. A lot of it is about language, and there's, I have a piece in there called Eve Was Framed, and the frame is in quotes, and it, uh, if you're, any of your listeners have seen the cover of the book, which is on the website, if anyone wants to look at it, it is an image of Eve in kind of a classical Renaissance depiction of Eve, and I talk about, I'm making a case basically that how we understand Western the Western paradigm for the place of women has been propagated by that particular myth of Eve in the garden and Adam being given the power to name her and thus define her. So I'm talking about that in my chapter, but there are many other amazing pieces, the erasure of lesbians that by Alex Dobkin and Sally Tatnell. Louisa Tisch wrote an amazing piece called Patriarchy and Drag sexual imperialism in Africa and delusional re revisionism in the African-American community. There's a piece on all about what's happening with women in, in sports. Males can now compete in female sport, in women's sports, as long as they're low, they lower their testosterone level us to a, a certain degree, but it's already 10 times higher uh, than women are allowed to or they would be considered doping. 
<laughs> it's 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 crazy. And that concludes our fourth edition podcast produced by the team at Women's Liberation Radio News for August 4th, 2016. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us to volunteer or comment, please email wlrnewscontact at gmail.com. We are looking for other women to join us in this radio news service and would love to see a copy of your resume and references. You do not need to have experience in radio to apply. We are volunteer-run, member-powered radio and are happy to work with you at whatever level of experience you have in radio journalism. Thanks again for listening. I'm Sekhmet Shiawal, your co-host. And I'm Katina Hyman, signing off for now. Thanks for tuning in. I am Thistle Patterson. And I am Shante Hosey, signing off from this fourth edition of WLRN. Be sure to tune in next time on September 1st. We are always interested to hear what you think. So that email address again is wlrnewscontact at gmail.com. Again, wlrnewscontact at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. But how will we find our way out of this? What is the antidote for the patriarchal kiss? How will we find what needs to be shown? And then after that, where is home? Tell me, where is my home?